Okay, there we go. So I've started the record. Uh, so we'll we'll start our session. I'm going to share my share my screen. Hopefully here, um, if I find the right the right thing to share, I think I've got it. So hopefully, what you have on your screen now is the slide. Somebody give me a thumbs up there. Yep, good, perfect. Okay, so tonight we're going to talk uh, about specifically about biomechanics of running and sprinting. Um, later on in the in the season, we're going to have some follow up sessions. Um, you can see this is listed as part one. So we're going to have a, a session on jumping, and another session on throwing. Hopefully later later on in the in the season, um, as well as some other presentations that are going to happen in this series. But uh, the ones I'll be tackling will be biomechanics uh, related. Um, so. Uh, just to give, oh, now I'm going to find out if I'm on the right thing here. There we go. So for those, I know there's quite a few people signed on and there was some names I, I didn't know right off. So I thought I better assume that they didn't know me either. So just to give you a little background on where I'm coming from on, on the discussion today, uh, my background um, as a biomechanist is um, I did a, a bachelor's and a master's degree in science uh, with a major in kinesiology from uh, Dalhousie University. Um, my focus in my master's research was on jumping biomechanics and particularly triple jump. Um, I then uh, later went on to University of Alberta to do doctoral research uh, with my main focus on sprinting biomechanics, uh, particularly looking at things like assisted versus resisted sprinting. And uh, my doctoral work was on sprint isolation drills or mock drills as we like to say. So that was sort of my sciencey background. Um, as a coach, uh, I've been coaching for long enough to have earned the white hairs and uh, about 20, a little over 20 years of coaching at the university level. So most of my time is, has been spent between club and, and a lot at university uh, level. And my main coaching in the past was sprints, jumps and combined events. But more recently, I've also become a, a cross country coach uh, or at least attempting to become a cross country coach. And uh, so that's a kind of relatively new uh, cap for me to wear. I did uh, do a bit of uh, cross country running when I was younger, but I won't claim to be a, a cross country coach yet until I get a couple more seasons under my belt, I guess. Um, I've been on a few different national teams. Uh, the, the part that I, I've enjoyed is the fact that on the national teams, I've now been in every event area. So I've done um, sprints, hurdles, uh, jumps, combined events, throws, and endurance uh, on different national teams. So I've uh, been fortunate to get experience at, at, those, uh, at that level and to work with coaches um, at that level from across the country and, and from around the world, really. So it's been fun learning from all those people and, and taking little, little nuggets from here and there. Okay, so we're going to dive right into the biomechanics part, but I'm gonna do a couple of slides here just to make sure we're all on the same language on the same sort of talking points. So when I talk about biomechanics, I think everybody's on board with the idea that we're, we're basically taking mechanical principles and uh, applying them to biological motion. So obviously we're, we deal with a lot of different topics in the area of biomechanics, whether it's you know physics and engineering, um, biology, mathematical modeling, all kinds of different aspects of that. And we, we apply it in all kinds of different ways. But in sports biomechanics, our main interest is in either reducing injuries to athletes or improving performance. That's pretty much what it comes down to. And often those two things are not separate. They are one and the same. Improving your mechanics often leads to both improved performance and re reduction in injuries. So they're kind of go hand in hand, but that's basically our goal as a sports biomechanist. Um, just real briefly want to go over just some some talking points to make sure that we're all again using the same language. So when we talk about planes of motion, when we break down the biomechanics of movements, we generally think of three primary planes that we identify to, to identify motions in as they refer to the, to, the, to the human body. So we'll look at things that are happening in the frontal uh, plane of motion, which basically divides us into front and back halves. We'll look at the transverse plane, which divides us into top and bottom. And the one that's really of most interest to us in, in running biomechanics in particular is the sagittal plane, where we're kind of dividing the body into left and right, um, left and right halves. Um, so why is it important that we kind of define this? Well, it, it obviously is important because a lot of our movements that we, how we define movement, how we look at movement is, is based on these planes of motion and technical aspects um, will reference those different planes of motion. And, and obviously we have different 
points of reference and, and angles at which we're going to observe activities based on knowing which planes of motion are the primary actions of, of the technique we're analyzing. So it's kind of important to make sure we're thinking about those. And obviously most skills involve movements in multiple planes. So it's not a question of it all being sagittal or all being frontal. It, it usually involves all of the planes of motion, uh, but certainly in running, most of the activity is in the sagittal plane. And certainly when we're running in a straight line, a little bit different when we're running on a curve, obviously, because there's a little more lateral movement going on. So we might look at, at a bit more things happening in the frontal plane or even in the transverse plane. Um, so here's just a, a slide kind of showing those three planes of motion. So we're kind of the, on the left side there, the frontal plane uh, splitting us into front and back, and then the transverse splitting us into top and bottom, and then sagittal splitting us into left and right. So the other thing that relates to then those planes is the axes of rotation. And, and they're basically, imagine the axis of rotation coming perpendicular out of those three planes. So when we look at the anterior posterior um, axis of rotation, we're looking at the front to back axis. So it's perpendicular to the frontal plane. So you can think of it as being what we would call a cartwheel axis. So it's movements that are going to be uh, moving with a rotation to the left or to the right of the person if you're looking from the front. If we think of the vertical axis, it's going up and down through the length of the body perpendicular to that transverse plane. And that's what we might call a twist axis. So think of rotating yourself around in a, in a left or right fashion. Um, and then the medial lateral axis is the uh, side to side axis, which is perpendicular to the sagittal plane or what we might call a flip axis or imagine doing a front flip or a back flip. And again, that's the one that's of most interest when we look at running because that's where most of the motions take place. Um, sometimes individual movements will be defined relative to anatomical points or directions. So, you know, there's a lot of terminology that can be used, but for our purposes, we're mostly going to be looking at things going on in, in that sagittal plane. So rotations around that medial lateral axis. Hopefully that all made sense. So if we take now a look at, uh, at our running body and we take a look at the, the primary joint actions taking place in running, and we're just breaking this down to the very major ones, like obviously almost all joints in the body are involved in running, but we'll kind of take it from a simple standpoint of thinking of the big ones. So we think of what's going on at the shoulder, what's going on at the hip, what's going on at the knee, what's going on at the ankle. And obviously there's a little bit of movement in other areas as well. So when we look at the shoulder, we're largely looking at flexion extension, although there is a little bit of um, abduction adduction or horizontal abduction adduction um, movements kind of side to side a little bit, but most of the movement from the shoulder is flexion extension in that sagittal plane. Similarly at the hip, we're gonna look at hip flexion and extension being the primary movements. But again, there's a little bit of rotation in other planes there as well, but the big movements obviously happen um, in that sagittal plane. Same with the knee, we look at flexion extensions of the knee and again, mostly happening in that sagittal plane. And then certainly the ankle with plantar and dorsiflexion. Um, and again, it can be multiplanar, but largely in the sagittal. And then we might also look at the elbow as an important factor. Certainly um, there is movement at the elbow and, and technical aspects about how we use the elbow in our running action. So that's important as well. And then definitely the trunk itself, because we might look at uh, in particular rotations in that transverse axis or around the, the vertical um, axis. Um, so there are things that are gonna happen in terms of rotations and flexion extensions happening at the trunk, but. If we now take a look at the muscles involved that are creating those movements, um, certainly the pectoralis and anterior deltoids are gonna be involved in that arm swing. Uh, latissimus dorsi and posterior deltoids involved in that arm swing on the driving back. Um, certainly the abs and low back are involved in stabilizing and, and controlling rotations in the trunk. The gluteal muscles, obviously very important in the hip extensions, along with hamstrings and hip extension and knee flexions. Um, the iliopsoas and to, um, controlling hip flexions and the quadriceps uh, involved a little bit in hip flexion, but also knee extension, which is a critical one we'll, we'll see. Um, the gastrocnemius and soleus, the, the calf muscles, if you will, the triceps serrae, obviously important. And our old friend, the tibialis anterior, probably the, the lesser known cousin of all those muscles that are involved in running, but a very crucial one. So if we take a look at how those muscles are activated during running, the gluteus muscles, particularly the gluteus maximus, is very much involved in hip extension during the late swing phase and early stance phases. And we'll see that uh, in a second in a graph. The hamstrings group, very involved in hip extension during the late swing, uh, 
and uh, and and stance phases. Um, very complicated muscle because it's uh, crossing both the hip and the knee, and we'll see how that plays a role in in its activation and what it does for us. Uh, the quadriceps, a very complex group as well, with all four of those muscles having different kind of roles to play, but certainly knee extension uh, during the late swing and early stance phase is really the critical role that they play. And then a little bit of hip flexion from the rectus femoris, one of the quadriceps muscles, along with um, actions from the iliopsoas group to, to control hip flexions during the swing phase of running. And then the gastrocnemius, which obviously is, is very active at the ankle, but also, um, remember, does cross the knee joint. So it's also a knee flexor. So it kind of, same, similar to the hamstrings, has a double role there and that it crosses two joints and kind of plays a slightly different role um, that we'll see how that plays out during the entire gait cycle. And then our old friend, the tibialis anterior, which is the, the muscle controlling that ankle dorsiflexion that we, that we love so much. And that's particularly active during the late stance phase as we pull the toe off the ground. Um, so if we take a look now at the EMG, uh, the electrical activity in the muscles during a running cycle, what I've got is on the graph, on the left side of the, the graph is gonna be uh, during the stance phase. So while the leg is on, while the foot is on the ground, and then on the right side will be the swing phase when that leg is cycling through to come back to contact the ground again. So if we take a look at the gluteus maximus, it's playing a, a role in the, the sort of initial stance phase as the foot is on the ground and, and pushing the foot to the backside under the hips. And then we see at the end of the swing phase, it's also initiating that leg to come down and contact the ground. So it's active right through swinging into the ground and then that initial push of the leg backwards. So the gluteus maximus very involved in that. Uh, the rectus femoris, which is one of the quadricep muscles that, that crosses the hip as well as the knee. So it plays a role in both uh, a little bit of the hip flexion, and you can see that in the swing phase there, in the early swing phase, the rectus femoris firing. Um, but it also obviously plays a big role as a knee extensor, and that's why we see it during the, the early to mid stance phase, as well as in the, the late swing phase as the foot is coming back to the track that knee extension obviously is very important. So then when we look at the other muscles in the rectus or in the uh, quadriceps group, the vastus medialis, vastus lateralis, um, we see those active during the late stance and, and early swing phases. So basically for ground preparation and that push on the ground and the initial ground contact. Um, the next one we have there is the, the hamstrings, the biceps femoris, semimembranosus and semitendinosus. And we see those obviously active through most of the stance phase as well as late in the swing phase. So it's that late swing where they're bringing the leg down to sweep underneath of us in what we might call that B action, where we're getting the foot down into ground contact. And then right through almost the entire ground contact, we see the activation in those, in those hamstrings. Um, the tibialis anterior, the little muscle on the front of the shin is active almost through the entire um, gait cycle. So if we think of it uh, through the swing phase, it's pulling the toes up to shorten the, the lever as we bring the leg forward. And it's also creating a stiff spring as we ground contact. And during that ground contact, it keeps that sort of stiffness of the ankle, which is so critical for, for uh, transferring energy from the body to the ground and the ground back to the body. So um, that stiff ankle joint is really important. So we see also the gastrocnemius and soleus muscles very active through most of the, of the movement. Uh, and again, the, the thing with the gastrocnemius, because it crosses the knee joint as well as the, the ankle, it can be involved in knee flexion to help with that recovery in the early swing phase. So that's why we see the gastrocnemius active even after we come off the ground and we're into the swing phase, that little burst that continues after that releases from the ground actually helps pick the knee up or pick the lower leg up by flexing the knee. So the, those complicated uh, biarticulate uh, muscles have a little more complicated role, but you can see how all those things kind of factor in. Are we good so far? Am I talking too fast or is that good? I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this, but everybody, I see some thumbs up, so that's good. Okay, so if we take a look at just our sort of normal gait cycles, um, I have some, some sequential photos here. Uh, I believe this is Saeed Awida for those who are as old as me and might remember him. Um, so just looking at a, you know, he was a 1500 meter runner for those who don't remember him. So if we take a look here at a world-class 1500 meter runner, we see the sort of gait cycle 
that um, uh, we see the foot coming down to the track by and hitting the track sort of in that second frame. And then we see through mid support by the third pitcher and then into the late stance phase in the fourth pitcher. And then we're at toe off by the fifth pitcher down there in the left uh, bottom. And then we're in the flight phase through that, those next three pitchers coming back to close to ground contact by the last pitcher. So it sort of takes us through, um, it sort of takes us through that whole gate cycle pretty much from the right leg uh, hitting the track and cycling back to the front. And then we get to the left leg coming down. So it's, it's what we would call a step. Um, in biomechanics terms, we talk about a step being from left to right or right to left and a stride being from right back to right or left back to left. So what we're looking at here is basically one step um, pretty much, okay? Um, to compare that now with the mechanics of a sprinter, um, this, is, uh, this was Patrick Johnson, I believe, if I remember correctly. He was an Australian sprinter back mm, in the 90s, I'm going to say. Um, I always tell everybody that's why the picture's in black and white. We didn't have color back then in the 90s. Um, anyway, so you can see here, similar sort of looking at the gate cycle. We see him at toe off in the top left um, through the flight phase and then preparation for ground contact in the third pitcher. And then by the fourth pitcher, we've made ground contact just in front of the hip. And then we're at fifth pitcher, we're at sort of mid stance. And then we've gotten around to toe off on the right side on that bottom right corner. So it takes us through sort of a full step. <coughs> so on, on the face value, sometimes we think that sprinting and running are very, very different, but they really aren't. Um, they're actually very, very similar in most respects. So if we were to take a look at both of these athletes at around the same point of their gait cycle, so we see them here at toe off, what you see is two athletes who are running at very different speeds, but really are hitting very, very similar positions. Um, so if we take a look, we, we see similar sorts of positions. Now, the difference is that the sprinter's range of motion is a little bigger and the, the movement speeds, the uh, angular velocities of the segments might be a little faster. But overall, if we were to just look at them as stick figures in this one moment, we would probably have a hard time picking out exactly which one is a sprinter and which one is a, a middle distance runner just based on what the legs are doing. Um, you know, again, it really comes down to just range of motion. So you can see that the red figure, which is, uh, which is Patrick Johnson's, the knee is a little higher uh, than Saeedoida's, um, but the back extension, the, the leg is very similar in what it's doing on the ground at toe off. Um, so if you just look at that support leg, they look almost identical. Um, obviously the arms are a bit different because it's a bigger, faster motion for the sprinter. But again, so many similarities, probably more similarities than differences. Um, so now we get into a little bit of more sciencey stuff um, just briefly. So we're gonna talk a lot about momentum. We're gonna talk about forces and acceleration. So just to kind of lay the groundwork again, so we, we think about the momentum of the body or any object, it's the amount of motion possessed by the body, which is reflected in the mass of the, of the object or body and the velocity at which it's moving. So that's what momentum is, right? It's, a, it's how fast is that mass moving? That's what momentum is. Acceleration is the change in velocity and it's proportional to the net force that's applied to the body and its mass. So generally speaking, we don't change our mass very much when we're running. Uh, you could argue there is some slight mass transfer if you're exhaling a little bit of water vapor, you're, you're potentially losing some mass through sweat and, and, and um, like say through your breath and stuff, but basically your mass stays constant. So when we're talking about acceleration, we're talking about a change in velocity, not a change in mass. So if we want to accelerate, we have to apply forces. Good old Newton said that uh, in his laws of motion that to accelerate, we have to apply a force. A change in momentum uh, is known as an impulse. And an impulse is determined by how much force we apply and how long we apply it for. So the force that we apply multiplied by the time for which we're applying that force gives us an impulse, which is gonna give us a change in that momentum, okay? And again, since our mass isn't changing, really what it's doing is changing our velocity through acceleration. So, when we think about an impulse, and it's, again, it's the product of both the force that's applied and the amount of time that we apply it for, we can think of two extreme versions here where we have a really high force that's applied for a relatively short period of time, or we could have a really 
a uh, much lower force applied for a much longer time. And those two things would still result in the same impulse. They would still have the same effect on changing the, the velocity of the body on which those forces are acting. Now in running, we tend to have the one where it's a very large force for a very short period of time because we're not on the ground very long. If we had ridiculously long legs and could maintain contact and acceleration through a, a wider range, we might be able to apply forces and uh, for a very long period of time and have large forces end a long amount of time, which would mean we would run really, really fast. But because of our anatomy, we're only able to maintain contact with the ground for so long and therefore we have a short period of time in which to apply forces, which means our goal as a runner is to apply large amounts of force in a short period of time. And the better a job we do of that, the faster we run, whether we're a distance runner, whether we're a sprinter, um, hurdler, anything. Um, so our job really is to try to apply large forces in short periods of time. So if we go back to looking at the forces acting on a runner, let's take a look at our sprinter here again. So I've Imagine their whole body mass represented by this point symbol here, this um, center mass symbol. And so they have a body weight that's gonna act downward. And whether you're on the ground or off the ground or whatever, that's gonna be the same, right? Your body weight isn't gonna change there. We're not changing our mass while we're running effectively. There's obviously gonna be a little bit of wind resistance involved uh, when we're moving through air. There is, you know, it's, it's a somewhat negligible amount most of the time, or at least when we're indoors, certainly it is. Outdoors, it can be very non-negligible. Um, it can be brutal if you're running into a big headwind, but it is something that can be factored in uh, to a certain extent. Then we have the ground reaction force. So the force that the earth is exerting against our foot as we hit the track. So in that initial ground contact there on the left, we see that the force is obviously vertical. There's, there's some force going up to keep us um, from going through the ground. <laughs> So the ground resists our motion to push up, but we can also see it's angled back a little bit. And what we have, if we think of those two components is we have a vertical ground reaction force that's acting up that effectively counteracts and overcomes the gravitational force, which is going down. And then we also see that little bit of acceleration uh, or sorry, a force that's pointed back in the opposite direction to which we are running. And so that's what we would refer to generally as a braking force. Okay, because it's slowing us down. It's in the opposite direction to that which we want to move. So that's generally what happens at an initial ground contact is we're going to have a little bit of braking force that happens along with that big vertical force. As we move to the mid stance phase, we can see that we've got essentially at that point in the exact middle, we've just got a large vertical ground reaction force and we don't have any um, force pointing in the horizontal direction in this case at this moment. We're exactly on top of our center of pressure and uh, that's all that we have. Then as we get to the late stance phase and we're towing off, we can see now that that ground reaction force is pushing us up again still, but also now is angled forward so that we're getting what we would call a propulsive force in the horizontal direction. So that's what basically then reaccelerates us and pushes us off the ground. And so those are the things that make us change our speed during ground contact. Now, while we're in the air, we don't have contact with the ground. We, we don't have that ground reaction force. So really all we're left with in the air is the gravitational pull pulling us back to earth and whatever wind, wind resistance is, is going on to potentially slow us down. But while we're on the ground is when we, as an athlete, can make a change in what we're doing. That's when we can apply force. That's when we can actively be engaged in, in this. So that's really the important part of running is what happens on the ground. And that's where most of our our training and certainly most of our technical models reflect what's happening when we're on the ground because that's that's where the game is, right? So if we take a look at these ground reaction forces in a, in a typical running pattern, what we have here is um, kind of a slower run, I, I would say, based on the on the forces that we're looking at and the ground contact time we're, we're looking at. Um, it's probably just sort of a nice easy run. Um, so when we push on the ground and the ground pushes back on us in the opposite direction, but with the same magnitude. So there we see the blue line on the graph is the vertical force reflected there in Newtons. Um, and we see a certain specific shape that we'll talk about in a minute. And then the red line is representing the anterior posterior forces. So it's that braking and propulsion forces that are going on during the ground contact. If we're, if we're running at a steady state, if we're at a, at a steady pace, where we're not changing, we're not accelerating, we're not speeding up or slowing down. The 
the ground reaction forces in that anterior posterior direction should essentially cancel each other out, right? Um, or maybe be slightly more propulsion because of wind resistance. But essentially what we're looking at is the first part of it is slowing us down during ground contact and the second part is speeding us back up during the ground contact. And then while we're in the air, the only thing that's that we have no ground contact, we have no ground reaction forces because we're in the air. So the only thing acting then, like I said, is gravity and, and wind resistance. So the, the, the key is that we can only accelerate by pushing on the ground. So as I said, that's what the game is. Any mechanical changes we want to make in running are mostly reflective of things that are happening while we're on the ground. It's all about putting forces into the ground. So because, as I said before, we're only on the ground for a short time, we have to use very high forces to get the impulse generated that we want. And so we have very short ground contact times to create these forces. So um, that's kind of the, the nature of the beast. So we have very short time to have effect on what we're doing. So we really have to be good at putting force into the ground in a short period of time. So it's not just about large forces, but it's about the rate of force production. How quickly can we create those forces? And really in running, it's not so much about what the maximum force you can create is, it's more about that rate of force production. Because it's not like you're reaching your maximum force production during that very brief ground contact, but it's about getting as much of that as you can in that short period of time. So it's really more about the rate at which you can create force rather than what the level of force is. Does that, does that make sense? Is that clear? I see some nodding heads, so that's good. We'll move on. Uh, I see a thumbs up. Thank you, Ethan. Um, okay, so what we have here now is a series of ground reaction forces, and these ones are just vertical ground reaction forces. But what we see is some different shapes, and they're reflective of different techniques that are being employed. So the one that's a sort of a solid line, um, you can see is, they refer to it as rear, rear foot running, or what I would uh, call maybe uh, heel striking a little bit. Um, and then we see that there's some forefoot running is the dotted line. If you look at those two curves, so the solid black line and the, the sort of dotted line, you see a very different shape because you see the dotted line has a higher peak uh, force. Um, it's the rate of force production is a little bit different. And you, what you don't see is that little extra spike, that initial spike. If you look on the solid line, you see a little plateau before it goes back up again. And that's literally when the ground contact, that heel contact happens. And honestly, usually you'll see a much more pronounced spike than what's reflected in this particular graph. You'll see something a little more pronounced in the heel strike, like in the previous slide that we were looking at, that previous graph. So we can contact the ground in different ways when we're distance running. And depending on how we uh, hit the ground with our foot and, and what our body is doing, uh, where it's positioned relative to that foot when it hits the track, we're going to get very different ground reaction forces and, and both in the vertical, but also somewhat more importantly in the horizontal direction. But that's what's going on there. We can, we can employ different techniques. So in distance running terms, this comes down to a big argument that uh, a lot of coaches have, um, which is about how do we strike the ground? And I'm going to, to tell you right up front, speaking as a biomechanist and speaking as a, uh, as I guess a cross country coach, distance coach, um, I am very much on the midfoot strike side of the argument. Um, and and you'll, you'll see my case here and then, but I, I know some of you probably have some different opinions about that. And we can maybe talk about that uh, towards the end of the presentation because I do think it's a contentious issue for some people. But if we think about uh, these two types of categories, I guess, of, of ground mechanics, of ground strikes, if we look at the heel striker, we basically are contacting with the posterior lateral border of the foot. So kind of back at the heel on the outside edge of the heel is normally what will hit first for a heel striker. And the center of pressure will pass along the length of the foot and pass towards the big toe because we always want to toe off on the big toe. That's the strongest place to put the final uh, push through. So that's the pattern that we see in terms of the center of pressure passing along the length of the foot. Um, so, you know, there's a typical heel striker. We see normally the foot striking well out in front of, of, the, uh, of the hips uh, with a very pronounced uh, dorsiflexion of the foot, but with a, uh, like I said, a very pronounced heel strike at that lateral posterior border of the shoe. If we look at a midfoot strike, and I believe this picture is from our old friend Saida Wida again. I think I just cropped it from there. 
um, what we see is the initial contact with with the ground is more like along halfway to two thirds of the way along the uh, the shoe. And again, it's on the lateral border. And you can see that in the picture. You can see how the foot is sort of out to the side and the lateral border is gonna touch down kind of midway along. And so from there, the center of pressure kind of rolls a little bit towards the heel as the whole foot rolls onto the ground. And then again, passes up towards the big toe as we go to toe off um, to, to, the, to the end of it. So in the midfoot strike, we're seeing the foot acting a little more like a, a little bit like a, I don't wanna say shock absorber because it is a very stiff structure, but it, it definitely is translating um, forces a little differently than, than we see in the heel strike. Uh, and we see that reflected in those ground reaction forces, both um, vertical and anterior posterior forces. There's quite a big difference. So um, if you think about the bony structure of the foot, it is sort of designed to work that way. Um, that's why we have all those little joints down in the, in the foot is they all kind of act to translate forces and absorb a little bit of the impact and uh, it works very effectively if we allow it to. Unfortunately, these days we seem to have reverting back to shoes that are bigger and uh, try to control our motion a bit more. Um, you know, and that right now seems to be providing uh, performance benefits. Um, certainly World Athletics has put some caps on exactly how much, <laughs> how much you can do with those shoes. Um, and I would suggest rightly so, but even if you're running with those shoes, it's important to remember that foot mechanics are really critical. What goes on in those small joints in the foot, those intrinsic joints in the foot, and certainly what goes on at that ankle joint, um, really critical in terms of how we hit the ground, but also in terms of how we control those forces that are, that are coming in through the ground, through our foot and passing up the chain. And, and if we're doing a poor job of that, not only does it affect performance, but it also uh, can have really big effect for injuries because of those large impacts that happen potentially at ground strike. And, and in heel strikers, that does tend to be one of the issues that we often have is a very passive um, ground strike, which leads to some really big impact forces that are going up the chain. So that affects both performance and potentially injury. So um, I'm going to leave it at that because that could be a whole lecture on its own talking about that. But like say, maybe at the end, if anybody has questions or wants to talk about that a bit, we'll, we'll get into that. Um, does that sound good? Yep, I see some nods, that's perfect. Okay, so here we see another set of ground reaction forces. These ones are more from a sprint um, and we can tell that based on the, ground, or, uh, on the ground contact time, we can see that it's a lot shorter here where it's just over a 10th of a second. So we're starting to look at a faster run, not necessarily a, a full out maximum world-class sprint, but we're definitely looking at a faster run. So it's either a very up-tempo um, middle distance or it's a long sprint or something like that. So on the bottom, we see the vertical ground reaction forces and we see that sort of typical shape of one big sort of mound, one, one big mountain. If we look up at the horizontal ground reaction forces that are in the, the upper graph there, we see the breaking of propulsion, which are, which are marked there with a B and a P very cleverly. Um, so what we see in the initial ground contact is that little bit of breaking. We see a little spike in it at first as the foot first contacts the ground, because even when we're sprinting, our foot is moving forwards relative to the ground, even though it's moving backwards relative to our body it is still moving forwards relative to the ground. So when it hits the ground, there is that initial sort of frictional forces and stuff that stop the foot and, and, and deliver a braking force. But then as we get through that, that uh, mid stance and we get to where we're now able to push behind, we see the propulsive forces um, take over and we're pushing through to the backside. Now, looking at this graph, I would make a guesstimate. Um, and again, this isn't my graph. This is one I stole from a paper. Um, but I would look at this and suspect that this is during acceleration phase because you can see how much bigger the propulsive impulse is than the braking impulse, which means there's a net gain in speed um, based on that. So I would suspect this is from the acceleration phase of a, of a long sprint, just based on the shape and the, and the magnitudes of the forces and so on. Really doesn't matter. But anyway, you see the shape, you see what we're talking about in terms of that braking and propulsion. So one of the goals for the athlete should be to minimize how much braking force there is at ground contact, therefore maximizing the benefit of the propulsive forces that they are generating. So hopefully they then, like I said, if it's at steady, steady state running, uh, 
um, those two things are going to balance out. If it's during acceleration, then we're going to see the propulsive forces being um, greater than the braking forces. But in the end, one of the things we're always trying to do is reduce that braking force um, when we're running. A um, little different case when we're jumping, when we get to the takeoff board, but that'll be for another, that'll be for another talk on another day. Um, so as we go along now, this is my new favorite graph in the world. Um, and I'll tell you why. This is some data looking at um, the horizontal and vertical ground reaction forces of a sprinter going right from the start and through, I think it's about the first 11 contacts, if I remember. Let's see, here we go. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. No, 15 contacts. There we go. So the first 15 steps of a sprint. So it, I love it. <laughs> I get really excited about this graph now. I'll calm myself down. What I like about this graph is that it really demonstrates a lot of the principles of um, ground reaction forces, but also in particular looking at sprinting in acceleration phase, we can see how we transition from accelerating and we transition up to maximum speed and we can see what's going on in those forces. So if we look at the red line is representing the velocity um, that the body is hitting. Um, so you can see it's not a super fast sprint here. We're only getting up to about seven meters per second. So it's not a super fast sprint, um, but it's only 15 steps in. But the, uh, the other thing we see here is the ground reaction force curve. So the sort of yellowish looking curve is the vertical forces and the brownish one is the horizontals. So what you see in the first couple of steps is really high amount of impulse generated in the horizontal direction. Okay, so we see all of the force is above zero. It's all positive force, which means it's all propulsive. There's no braking going on in those first few steps, on the first couple anyway. We can see by about the third step that we start to have a little braking blip. So you can see that brown line dip below zero. And that's where the when we have that initial ground contact, as the body starts moving faster, it get, becomes harder and harder to have the foot not be moving um, forwards right? If that makes sense. So it's moving back relative to the body, but it starts to move forward relative to the ground the faster we're running. We can't move our foot fast enough to sort of match the speed with which we're running, essentially. So there is that brief moment where the foot hits the track and there's a braking force because the foot is moving um, forward relative to the ground. And so there is a little bit of moment where there's a braking force. And as we look across on those 15 steps, we can see that braking force becoming more pronounced as we go along from those first couple of steps till as we approach um, sort of steady state or maximum speed towards the right. So that's the first thing that we kind of notice. The other thing we notice is the magnitude of those propulsive forces is, is huge in those first few steps. And the vertical forces are not as big in those first few steps. And they become much bigger, as you see, as we get down to about 10 steps into this, we can see the vertical forces are now peaking out, uh, you know, closing in on 2,500 Newtons. Whereas at the start, they were only just, you know, over 1,000 to 1,200 Newtons. So they're more than doubling in their magnitude uh, in the vertical direction. But we see the, the horizontal forces, while the peaks aren't particularly decreasing a lot, they're staying kind of around that 500 Newton for a peak force, we can see that the amount of time that we're on the ground is changing and therefore the impulse, remember we talked about the amount of time that we're applying those forces is changing because as we start moving faster and faster, the foot is on the ground for less and less time. So in those first couple of steps, that's when the sprinter has to be patient and actually finish their pushes to generate as much acceleration as possible in those first few steps. So what we don't want is we don't want quick little pitter pats. Um, because that's not going to give us enough impulse to create meaningful acceleration. Now, having said that, it doesn't mean that we leave the foot on the ground for as long as possible. We don't want to bound out of the starting blocks, but we do want to maintain big, long pushes because we are, our body's velocity is, is very low. We can have the foot moving in such a way that we're getting it to hit under the hips and be all push. So those first couple of steps, we really can create a lot of, ver of horizontal force um, from big patient pushes. Now powerful, the movements are fast, but patient in that we finish them. We make them big movements, even though they're fast, we don't chop them, we don't cheat on them. We finish the pushes. So if you look at the ground contact times, and you can see that based on, if you look at the brown line and see where it, it touches the zero, right? Every time it touches the zero, that's where we're, we're 
kind of going to see now, okay, this is a ground contact. So we see that first lump and we touch the zero and then we have another lump and we touch zero and then we see a little breaking force and then a lump above and then we touch zero. So every time we're touching zero at the end of that positive ground force uh, in the horizontal, that's where we're hitting the ground. And what we see is that as we get going, there's more and more of that breaking force that happens at that first contact. But also look at the length of that contact. So it's very long and the, the first step is, I would say about 0.3 seconds or more, that first ground contact. And the second one is probably about 0.5. And then they start to get shorter and shorter. And by the time we get over to the you know, 10th, 11th, 12th steps and over the 15th step, we see the ground contact time is now down to being about 0.2 of a second. So we have less and less time on the ground to apply those forces. So as I said, that's why the, the rate of force production becomes so critical as we close in on, on faster speeds in particular, because we have very little time to apply those forces before the foot is gone and it's underneath of us and we gotta pick it back up off the track, okay? Is that not the most beautiful graph you've ever seen, Evo? Yeah, I knew you'd like that one. <laughs> I just knew you'd like that one. I, I love that one. Uh, and in fact, here's an even bigger version. Of it. This one actually carries us through a few more steps. So you can see this one actually takes us through the first six seconds. So we get a few more contacts out of it, I think. But you can really see clearly now what's going on in terms of the braking forces. And this one is a much more world-class, I would say, kind of attempt because we see we're getting up to around 10 meters per second for, uh, for speed. So we're, we're dealing with a faster run here. And we can see again, though, that the length of the ground contacts becomes shorter and shorter as we go from the acceleration end on the left towards the full speed on the right. So we see those ground contacts uh, times getting shorter, but we also see those vertical forces becoming really, really large um, as we get to the further and further to the right. And we also see again, those braking forces becoming a little more pronounced as we get going faster and faster because it's harder to have the foot match the speed of the ground. And therefore the foot is always moving forward a little bit relative to the ground as we get our bodies moving forward faster. If that makes sense, you have to picture that relative frame of reference. So it's moving fast, very fast relative to our body, but it's still moving forward relative to the ground because we're moving forward so fast we can't match that speed. Um, so yeah, these are a couple of my new favorite graphs in the world. Um, and I get very, ex very excited about them as a biomechanist and as a sprint coach. Um, so the other thing that, that's relative to this that's important is when we think about where those forces are coming from, how we generate them. If we think back to earlier here, we were talking about what joints were active and what muscles were active and what joint actions were, were prominent. Knee extension is by far the most important movement to create those forces, right? So when we're pushing to accelerate, because our body is angled forward, the knee extension drives us forward. It's creating horizontal forces. And that's why we see uh, in those early steps, the vertical forces and horizontal forces are actually closer together in terms of the magnitudes um, because the quadriceps are generating a huge amount of knee extension. And in those early steps, because of the angle with which we're positioned, a lot of that knee extension is creating horizontal ground reaction force. And then later as we accelerate and we come, become more upright in our running, that knee extension now is directed vertically downward. And so that's res resulting in those large vertical ground reaction forces. So knee extension is absolutely critical for generating the forces to accelerate as well as the forces to maintain velocity, right? So that's the critical action. Um, the other kind of component that we, we think about a little bit then in the running action is how quick can we take these steps as we get going faster and faster. And I've got another one of my famous favorite graphs coming up here in a couple of slides and we'll see why that's an important factor. But so yeah, there's my, my favorites. So we'll look a little bit now at sort of the optimal and I'm gonna say sprint mechanics, but for those of you who are more distance oriented, the mechanics are the same. They're just smaller. Um, they're not, uh, you know, the ranges of motion are, um, a little smaller and the, the, the peak angular velocities of the segments are a little slower, but overall it's the exact same things that are important to a large extent. So if we take a look at running speed, no matter whether it's running, whether it's sprinting, running speed is determined by stride length and stride rate. So how long do we take, you know, how big is each step going and how quickly can we take those steps? Um, so those are important factors that we consider. <clears throat> 
if we look at sprinting in particular, but as I said, running in general, there's a lot of different measures that we can take, both kinematic and kinetic measures um, that will tell us something about how the activity is being done. But there's a few key ones that research shows us are really the critical factors. So one of them is the maximum angular velocity of the thigh in swing. Um, what that means is how fast can you get your leg from the backside to the front side, right? So how fast can you flex your hip to bring it back to the front side to take your next running, running step, right? Your next stride. So that's a really critical one. We know that. And we know that both in sprinting and, and in, in uh, distance running to, to a large extent as well. The next really critical one is that relative velocity of the foot pre-contact. So just before the foot hits the ground, what is its speed relative to the body or relative to the ground, whichever one you wanna look at. And it's really about having that foot moving backwards as fast as possible to be as active into that foot contact as possible. And that's again, true for both sprinting and for, um, for uh, endurance running, okay? Uh, another really critical one is the ground contact time. And, and we know that whether you're a good sprinter or a good distance runner, it doesn't matter. The better athletes have shorter ground contact times when they're at steady state. So whether at maximum velocity or at the steady state that, you know, their race pace, whatever. We know that they have shorter ground contact times, right? They're not spending a lot of time with the foot in front of them. They're on the ground. The foot is almost underneath the hip right away. They get a big push behind and they're back off the track as quick as they can. Um, the other one that becomes very critical, again, both in sprinting and definitely in, in distance running, is the minimum knee angle during stance. Really good runners, no matter what speed you're running, don't flex the knee very much as it passes under the body. It's a very stiff um, joint, ideally. So it's not acting like a big giant shock absorber. It's not flexing and extending. It's staying very stiff, like a, a very stiff spring as opposed to being a shock absorber, right? So it's taking that energy and immediately translating it back. So the, the less knee flexion that we see happening during the stance phase, that's more reflective of better running, basically. Okay, um, so these are, this is, <laughs> these are just figures from my, my doctoral research, but it's just basically showing you that these are all things we can measure, whether it's through video, um, or whatever, we have ways to measure these things. They've been researched and we know that there's some really critical things that we can measure and look at. Um, and so, some of those ones I just highlighted are among the, the more critical ones that are easy for us to kind of appreciate. Okay, um, so this is my other favorite graph in the world. And this one is showing us what happens with stride frequency and stride length as we run at different speeds. So each little dot on the graph represents somebody running at a certain speed. And then as we go across those dots, we see what happens when we go at different speeds. So if we take a look in the bottom left corner, somebody running at four meters per second, we have a certain stride length and a certain stride frequency they were associated with this person running four meters per second. Okay, and obviously this is different for everybody, but this is an example of somebody doing this, a theoretical model. So at four meters per second, we have a certain stride length and we have a certain stride frequency or stride rate. As we ask that person to now run faster and they go from four meters per second to five meters per second of running speed, what we see, the big change is not in the frequency with which they take the steps, but the length of the step that they take. So we see that they make a, a take a bigger step essentially. So they're applying more forces. Now, because they're only moving at fo uh, five meters per second, they still are on the ground for a fairly long time and they can generate those forces um, relatively easy. And, uh, and make that change in stride length through just applying more force. We now continue that and ask the person to go six meters per second. And we see again, a little bit of a change in the stride frequency. They're taking those steps a little faster, but the big change is still in terms of the length of the step they are taking. So we now see the step length going up to about two meters per step. Um, and we see, like I said, a little bit of a change in the stride frequency becoming a little faster. But now as we go from six meters per second to seven meters per second, we start to see bigger changes happening in terms of the stride frequency or the rate at which we take the steps. And then again, as we go from seven meters per second to eight meters per second, and now we're, we're talking about sprinting, at eight meters per second, 
we now see that change being more based on changing the rate at which we take the steps rather than the length that we take. So because of the, the ground contact time becomes very short or becomes shorter and shorter the faster we go, we have less time to apply forces and therefore we can't accelerate our body through that contact to make a longer stride length. So what we end up doing is accommodating to make more steps per second. And that's where hip flexion becomes the really critical factor. So now the iliopsoas and the rectus femoris become really critical in running faster and faster and faster because it's all about getting that leg back to the front side or what we refer to as front side mechanics. This is where, um, you know, Usain Bolt is, is a great example uh, of why and how this works. Um, he is excellent at taking a really long lever i.e. his leg, and getting it accelerated back to the front side of the body to take his next step. His stride rate is, is exceptional. For someone with legs as long as he has, the stride rate he achieves is, is phenomenal. And that's why he runs so fast, because he has both a great stride length because of the length of his leg. And because of the power of his hip flexors, he is able to have a really high stride rate. So as we look at this graph, and we go from eight meters per second to nine and from nine to 10, we see that the changes really become all about how fast we can take the steps and not about creating bigger steps. So it's really not about the pushers or the extensors of the hip. It's really about the flexors of the hip that become important. So when we think about that, when we break it down, really what we've figured out is that the quadriceps and the iliopsoas group are the most critical things in running because the quadriceps are providing a lot of that acceleration early on, but also at steady state, there would apply as most of that vertical force and the resisting of the flexing of the knee is all coming from quadriceps. And then as we go to faster speeds and we need to get the leg back to the front side, the iliopsoas uh, and rectus femoris become the critical things that drive that leg to get back to the front side. So even as a distance runner, that becomes a really critical thing is how quickly can I take those steps? Because I don't want to be on the ground a long time. I want to be bouncy. I want to be responsive to my ground contacts. I mean, that's what those new shoes are all about. Having those carbon plates is about re being really bouncy and stiff in the ground contact and translating the energy well. And so we can see that stride frequency becomes a really critical factor when we look at whether it's top speed sprinting or high rate, um, you know, high speed uh, distance running, it's really becomes more of a factor of that stride frequency. It becomes the, the critical, the thing that differentiates people. Okay, uh, I just want to do a quick little bit on um, on starting mechanics because they are slightly different, um, obviously from just upright sprinting, but a lot of the same principles we see. If we look at this, uh, I believe this is Okiki Akinremi, uh, for those who are old enough to remember him as a Canadian sprinter on the relay teams and so on back in the day, back in the 90s, I would say. Um, really good model of a great setup. And, and if we look at the set position that he has, a couple of the things I look for um, in a set position, we see his shoulders right over top of his hands. We see his thigh of his rear foot um, leg, basically vertical under his hip. We see the fairly flat or neutral back position. And we see the two shin angles, the two, uh, you know, the, the angle of both of his shins are very parallel. They're very similar. Those all set up to be good a good position to really apply forces to accelerate out on that first step and make our block clearance. So for me as a sprint coach, those are some of the things I look for in my block. And, you know, we all have sprint coaches out there. We all have our different sort of things that we want our athletes to do in the blocks. But I, I always felt that this picture right here really reflected what I personally look for in a good set position. Um, so that's why I guess this picture is on here. Cause I think it's a good one. Um, so we see now uh, the drive coming out we see in the, the sort of fourth picture, that's uh, one in the middle on the left, really good extension. What I would say I call head to heel. We see that long line extended all the way through the trunk, down through the extension uh, of, the, of the leg and off the, off the pedal. So we see that really good long push and patient push, I would say. We see the block clearance there on that next picture on the right in the middle. Um, we see now he's in the air briefly, and then we see the foot coming down in the bottom left corner. You'll see he's going down to ground contact, and you can see the foot is actually, I don't even think it's on the track yet, and yet it's already underneath the hip. And so it's going to be pure push. There's going to be no braking force on this because he's basically going to be pushing straight back behind him. And because the body is not moving forward very fast yet, because it's only the first step, um, 
he can actually have the foot move backwards relative to the ground and therefore have no braking force there in that first contact. And so it's all pure push. And then we see the big knee extension and hip extension through that second last pitcher. And then again, into the head to heel um, line where we see a big extension and nice strong push through that first step clear of the blocks. So I think it's a really nice set of pitchers showing what I think is a very effective um, block start. Um, you know, we see the big exaggeration in the arms that's reflected of the exaggeration of the longer pushes, the longer ground contact times that we see on the ground. That's why we want those big arm splits. Like, yeah, it's a little bit about accelerating the mass to create potentially greater reaction forces, but it's also about setting up the rhythm of what the legs are gonna do. The arms and the legs are gonna match rhythm. It's really difficult to run with your arms and legs out of sync with each other, uh, well nigh impossible. Um, so you can use the arms to help set or complement the rhythm of what you're looking for in the legs. So those exaggerated arm splits really are reflective of the more patient, bigger pushes that the legs are making. And, and so they become a good cue for the athlete because often it's easier for them to think about their arms than it is to think about their legs, even at the start. But certainly if we look at fatigue later on at speed endurance and, and fatigue, setting the cadence with the arms is often um, a much easier goal than trying to get the athlete to think about what they're doing with their legs because it's just easier. The arms are lighter and, and we think we can have a bigger impact on them maybe. Um, Anyway, so that's a, a look at starting mechanics. Um, I wanted to leave lots of time for questions and discussion. So that's kind of what I wanted to cover in terms of the biomechanics side and then maybe get into some, some questions. So um, we got lots of time to handle some questions. Um, I've got some other videos I can show if, if not, but um, I'd, I'd love to have a little uh, commentary, I guess, or questions. I certainly couldn't have talked that clearly that everybody everybody understood everything I said or, or agreed with everything I said, but who knows, maybe that's possible. Hey, Steve, I got a question. Lay it on me. Right on. Uh, well, first off, thanks for an awesome uh, presentation. Definitely lots to, to bite into there. <laughs> um, I'll just go with like the most, um, like, you know, you just talked about start mechanics. Mm. Um, for, I guess I'll look a lot of coaches here dealing with athletes uh, and their starts. How would you coach the start of somebody who isn't reaching that full extension coming out of the block? Mm. I, I, one of the things I really like to do, I've used for years is, um, and we do it quite regularly in, in, in practices is one pedal starts. Um, so I will do starts where we put the blocks down, but we don't actually get in them like blocks. We, we do like a standing start or almost like a rollover type start movement with only one foot on a pedal. So what we'll do to work on that extension off the pedal is I will put the person so that they're standing with their, so if they're a left foot starter, they will have their left foot on the right pedal. So they're kind of standing beside the blocks with just that one foot on a pedal. And we will get them to really exaggerate the push on that pedal and try to imagine them sort of supermaning themselves off of that pedal. And, and they might only, you know, might do a five or 10 meter uh, acceleration off of, but really the focus is just on that first big push, hitting a big arm split, really exaggerating ridiculously the extension off the pedal. And then what we do is, is, you know, it gets dialed back to, to what we really want when, once we start to do real starts with it. But with that drill, we can really exaggerate the amount of time that we push and the extent to which we hit that, that sort of head to heel extension. You can really exaggerate it on that. So I like to spend some time doing one pedal starts. We do both front and we do some rear pedal starts, which I didn't talk about at all. And in this in, in starting, but I do feel that that's a really critical one too, is what the rear foot does on the pedal in that first movement. Because if you look at ground reaction forces from the starting blocks, the rear pedal is actually where the biggest spike in force comes from. And it's that rear foot kicking into the pedal to initiate both the leg drive forward of that foot, but also that helps initiate the shifting of the center of mass forward to get it ahead of that front foot and get us to a really good pure push position. So that drill, I think, also helps get them effectively to the, to the position to make that push. So I use both of those a lot of times in practices. One pedal start to look on either the back pedal uh, or the front pedal. Right on, thanks. Hey, uh, hey, Steve, uh, thank you for taking, uh, taking uh, time out of your day tonight to uh, talk to us. I just had a question kind of, what um what your take is on the whole 
super shoe business <laughs> that's going on right now. Yeah, Just yeah. because like for me personally, I did, um, I did a systematic review and a meta analysis as of just recent on um, on the effects of increased longitudinal bending stiffness yeah. on, um, on biomechanics and physiological factors. And I definitely like from even just your little comments, I'm just interested kind of to see what what your take is on it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess it comes kind of in two parts for me. Like this this stuff on stu- uh, shoe stiffness has been going on for a long time. Um, the guys at the biomechanics lab at University of Calgary were doing stuff with carbon plates in sprint spikes back in the 90s. Um, so it's not new. It's it's the fruition, I guess, of a couple of decades of research. Um, I, I, I'm of two opinions, I guess, on the, on the distance shoe, because I've never been a fan of big shoes. I'm very much a fan of, of minimalist shoes, um, because I think if trained well, the foot is designed very well to do the job. Um, obviously, the advantage of these super shoes is that they are taking the mechanics of our foot and enhancing them rather than replacing them. I guess is the way I would put that because we know that as I've said in the talk there, the stiffness of the foot and the stiffness of the ankle are critical for energy um, transmission. And the the carbon plates in those shoes basically is helping that, right? It's helping to transmit that energy, create a very stiff um, spring for relating those, those forces. So they obviously it, it works. Um, My only hesitation about them is it gets to the point where at what point are we now, becoming an equipment-based sport versus an athlete-based sport. And, and that cycling had to deal with this in years gone by because they were getting bikes that were just out of this world. And it almost became more about the bike than the rider. And I'm not saying we're quite at that point, but we are at the point where companies are admitting this is, you know, a 3% performance differences. In some cases, I think they're showing even higher than 3% um, differences in performance, right? Have, yeah, have no, you... that's, that's definitely true. Like I, yeah. when I was looking at the uh, general percentages, like, for the most part, research has been over the last like 10 years or so fairly equivocal in the sense that it really depends on how the carbon fiber plate is implemented. Mm -hmm. So as it stands right now, the most effective way, at least from what I could ascertain was a uh, like a top loaded carbon fiber plate um, combined with the like relatively high stack height is the best way to go in Mm -hmm. terms of their design, Um, just because it'll optimize to your point, the stiffness of the ankle. um, And then also allows for like uh, I think it's better efficiency for the most part at that metatarsal phalangeal joint and allows yep. for a, like a more powerful toe off in essence. Yeah, um, exactly. It creates the right, yeah. right angles to transmit those forces in the directions that we want. Right. So that, that high heeled sneaker <laughs> essentially gets our forces transmitted at the angles that we want to generate a lot of propulsion as we toe off. So yeah, like they're very effective and So as a biomechanist, I'm like, yeah, that's great. And as a coach, I'm like, ooh, but are we getting away from the athlete being the important thing? And at some point, obviously, it becomes a factor. It's like, imagine having a high jump shoe that was, you know, 10 centimeters high. Like, yeah, you just gained 10 centimeters on your jump height, but did you really? Or did the shoe just gain 10 centimeters for you? So, I mean, that's an exaggeration, obviously. But, you know, it's interesting to note that in the old old rule book, high jump was the only event that had a rule about the, the thickness of the sole. There was never a rule in place to limit how much soul you could have other than in high jump. Um, you know, and, and in, as far as, um, you know, stiffness, um, you know, and, and the dealing with the, um, the, the, the stiffness factor of the carbon fiber plates back in the old days, um, you know, triple jumpers, certainly Russian triple jumpers back in the day had steel plates in their, in their triple jump shoes to create really stiff springs. Um, and also protect their foot from the high ground reaction forces that they were they were having when they're hitting the hitting the ground. So um, I think that um, we have to be cautious about at some point it does become a little bit of a an, an arms race as to who can build the better shoe. And I like that the world athletics has, has stepped in now finally to sort of say, here's the limits of what you're allowed. Here's the parameters that you can work with, because initially there really was very limited parameters. It was just a free for all, and then suddenly it was exploding, right? So they have stepped in and put some limitations that I think will bring things a little bit back in line, so that it becomes an even playing field again for everybody, and it's not just who has the best, um, you know, shoe designer and and which athlete is signed on with which brand to to get the better shoe, you know? Because originally everybody was all about the Nikes, but the other companies have caught up quickly on the tech the technology, right? So. It's leveling the playing field quickly, but I'm glad that we have limitations on those parameters so it doesn't just become bigger, bigger, 
stiffer, like, you know, there are going to be limitations. So interesting stuff though, eh? If you look at the number of records that were broken in the last year in distance events in a year when we didn't have, right. It's insane. It's, It's insane. Yeah, no, it's actually insane. And like, it's not even, it's not even in the marathon or the half marathon, although those are primarily yep. a lot of the things, but it's also happening obviously on the track as well. Yeah, I mean, five you and saw like the 10K and the 5K is going down. Yep. Um, and I mean, as of recent, if you've been watching, and I'm sure you have been, um, a lot of the meets at the uh, new Hayward Stadium, you'll see a lot of the athletes even running in the 800 in that increased yep. um, stack height spike. Yep. And you can see that they're just running obscene times. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. So, yeah, no, it's really, well, I mean, when you, again, if the research is saying, you know, two, three, 4% difference, that's a big difference. Oh, it's huge. And especially over like a longer event, like a yeah. marathon where that ends up being like a couple minutes at yeah, so it, exactly. it's optimal for the athlete. Right. So, um, yeah, it's, it's yeah. an interesting one. Like I say, I'm glad they brought some regulations in because it could have gotten really out of hand, <laughs> yeah. but it's going to be an interesting one for the next while that people are going to keep tweaking with that and finding the right resonance and we're going to be you're going to get personalized shoes because different athletes are going to respond to them different and so they're going to be tuned basically shoes that you're going to be getting into just like just like cycling had with the bikes you know you became the bike was uniquely built for that individual it wasn't an off the rack like oh everybody's riding this bike it was this bike was custom built for this person and that's kind of what we're going to get to i'm sure with the shoes is having very specifically custom built shoes for people with very specific mechanics yeah awesome question Awesome discussion. Love that. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, any others that uh, are eating away at you or you want to dive into? Want to get into the heel strike, midfoot strike <laughs> conversation? Maybe one, Steve. Uh, yep. the, the last pictures and your, your start, I don't want to focus only on the start, but the, the uh, especially the front leg, the shin, uh, changes the angle at second frame, third frame. Yeah. Uh, do you have any issue with that? So if, uh, let me just pop it back up on the screen here, if I can, if I can figure out how the heck to, I got multiple things happening on two screens here. Let me see if I can get to the right one to share it. Uh, there we go. Nice. Okay. That should be up there now, the start pitchers. Uh, hopefully yes we, we got the right one up yep I see some nodding heads um, so if you look at, at at this sequence if you look at his his front foot on the block and you look at the shin angle there there's a little bit of a drop in the in the knee as you go from the first pitcher where he's in set and you see him um, pushing off the pedal in the second pitcher and then into the third pitcher you see a little bit of a shin angle drop and I'm actually not against that because I think it's getting him to create a deeper angle in that fourth picture where we see him at the full extension. Um, now the question is maybe it's just that he had the wrong block setting that he wasn't at the right chin angle to begin with. So like you, you might end up doing is moving his front pedal back a little bit closer to his rear pedal to actually already create that shin angle that we ended up in. So that might've been something if I was coaching him, God, wouldn't I have loved to have coached him? Um, if I was coaching him, that might've been something I would have said, Oh, let's try putting that front pedal back a notch or two, just to see if we can create that, that shin angle so that it stays constant in that deep angle that we were looking for. Um, Cause you can, you can see the, uh, the ankle, that leg bending going dorsiflex, more dorsiflex as well. So mm. I was thinking that maybe that absorbs some force that is created. Yeah. Yeah. Potentially. Right. I mean, okay. one of the things too, with those, those new blocks is now that we have those larger blocks, you're starting to see certainly at the world, you know, world uh, level. Um, that's one of the things those big pedals will do because the whole foot goes against the pedal now. So you don't have that heel drop over the top. So you're probably going to see bigger forces and better acceleration off those new, new block pedals because there's not going to be any waste of the heel dropping over the top of the block. It's solidly going into that big, massive pedal as well as the width of those pedals. So you're able to set up for the proper hip width of the athletes. So some of those, I can't imagine being like, Oh, Kiki, and Remy was a big guy and, and guys like that. Um, it's a pretty narrow thing. The starting blocks, when you think about it in terms of the, the size of some of these guys, especially if you look at like a Milan Co, a biomechanist from, uh, I think he's from Slovenia. He did a lot of research looking at the foot placements as you come out of the blocks. And in fact, what they see in the first, you know, half a dozen steps or so is the steps are actually much wider than the block pedals 
So you're essentially stepping a little bit laterally for the first couple of steps in a wider, and then they narrow back out as you accelerate up. And so those new block pedals that we're seeing, and God knows when we'll ever be able to afford uh, to have sets at the provincial level, but at the world level, um, I think you're going to see a lot better starting mechanics coming out of some people because of those taller and wider pedals. It creates a much better platform for pushing against. And so you're probably going to see um, more, more good starts, I guess, from people. So people who are good starters will start to have great starts and people who are great starters will be consistently great starters because I think those bigger pedals are going to lead to more consistent force applications than what the present pedal designs or, you know, the older pedal designs kind of allow for, because exactly like you say, the energy loss and that, that sort of change in the heel position uh, and ankle kind of mushing out a little bit on that push. So I think that'll be something that'll be interesting too, in terms of the technology side of things. Once we start to have more and more of those big pedals, we'll see better starts or more consistent starts, I guess I should say, maybe. I've got a question for you, Steve. Lay it on me, Tim. All right, well, thanks for that presentation. Um, I have a question about how would you address um, an athlete who maybe at top speed, their foot isn't landing under their hips and they're getting mm -hmm. more of a hamstring pull as opposed to that quad push? Mm -hmm. And maybe, maybe what would be some, uh, like a drill or something that you would use to help, help work well, with that? I, I tell you what I have become a huge fan of, and, I, and I'll admit to being a late comer to the party and that I've only been using it for probably the last three or four years, maybe five, but probably four consistently years. Well, oh, I forgot about COVID year. So five years, <laughs> forget that we kind of missed a year there. Um, I like wicket drills. Um, I had seen them for years and I thought they were gimmicky because I just kind of went, ah, it's just a gimmicky thing. And I didn't think too much about it, honestly. But then a few years ago, like I say, probably five or six years ago, I started to go, well, wait a minute, what, what are they doing with these? And I started to do some watching videos and reading articles and talking to coaches and started to get an appreciation for how I might incorporate them. And, and since we started doing them, probably, like I say, about five years ago, whatever, I have seen a marked improvement in how many people are hitting the right positions when they run. Um, purely because the drill, the way, at least the way we're doing them, what we're doing them for, we kind of use very short spacings and make people over rev the engine a little bit. They're taking very short, fast steps, but it also makes them really high step it a little bit. They really focus on bringing the leg forward and getting the knee high to step over that hurdle, even though it's only a little, you know, it's only a little six inch hurdle. Um, I have found that to be very effective on fixing people's mechanics that had kind of been a little more pushy and, and the foot hanging out behind. And as a result, the foot being slow getting back to the front side means it hits the ground before it has time to get under the hip because it hasn't got time. It spent so much time behind by the time it gets to the front, it hits the ground in front because it doesn't have time to get under the hip. Um, so I found wicket drills to actually be really effective for, for the athletes I work with. It's certainly been a great cue for a lot of them and we do them weekly. Uh, in fact, when we're doing a lot of times when we're doing either, um, uh, extensive or even um, intensive tempo. And certainly when we do a lot of our special endurance runs, we will use that as part of the warm up. is finished with some wicket runs to really cue the sensation that we're looking for them to carry into that. And I use that with my distance runners too. If they're doing some faster stuff on the track, we do wicket runs before they do it to cue them in that, that position of thinking more about turnover and getting that knee back to the front side. Um, so I really like that. I, I think that's been helpful for, for my athletes. Awesome. Thanks for that. You're welcome. Yeah, that was a that was a great question. I, I was thinking of something very similar to that, and I just wonder if um, you also had some success or or worked with uh, uh, progressive ankling uh, alongside of that. And yeah, then... I, I, yeah, absolutely. I, I do use a little bit of ankling, although I'll admit to a lot of times it becomes my go to for some of my injured athletes that can't quite do full movements. We do a lot of ankling. But I have used ankling with some of my distance runners to help them get a more um, stiff ankle, uh, you know, active ground contact kind of a feeling. Um, I find that really springy, fast contacts really helps them kind of get the feeling of what we're shooting for. In fact, literally today at the track, I had some high school kids doing ankle bleeds where we kind of went from an ankling to an over ankle to an over calf kind of a progression over a 30 meter. So 10 meters of ankle, 10 meters of over ankle, 10 meters of over calf trying to get them high, high cadence, you know, high, high frequency, 
but with really good stiff ground contacts and sort of then just expanding the size of the movement while still trying to keep that stiff ground contact. Yeah, exactly. Um, and have you, do you get them to go straight into like a full stride then from that? Like uh, I've done that yeah. outside. Yeah. I mean, I guess I haven't done that necessarily a lot. One thing I do like doing, we do a lot of what I call drill to sprint transitions where we'll use certain bounding or sprint drills that will carry into a transition zone that we then come out the other end sprinting. So for example, I might do something like a, a scissor bound for, for 15 meters or 20 meters and yeah. then have a 10 meter zone where they will slowly transition that from a scissor bound. And by the time they come out of the transition zone on the other end, they're into a sprinting mechanic and then we'll sprint away for, you know, 15 meters or whatever. So we might go 15, 10 meter transition, 15 meter sprint, or even 20, 10, 20, whatever. And, and so I do that sometimes with bounding, with high knees, with scissor bounds, uh, some different things like that to translate some of the things that we get out of the drill and then have them carry that feeling over into the sprinting action. And I know the guys at uh, the down in Arizona there at Altus, they use a lot of those, they call them bleeds, right? The ankle bleeds. And they do a lot of those where they transition it right up into running. I haven't done it right up into running. I don't think that much, but I, nothing against it. I just haven't had the occasion, I guess, to implement it or use it. But yeah, I think those kinds of things are very helpful for people. I'm big on people doing drills that help them create the feeling that we then want to reproduce in the full movement. Right. And, and that way we sort of give them a sense of it's easier to get people to feel that springy contact when they're doing ankling and then go, okay, now I want you to feel that same thing when you're running. Right. We create the feeling and then have them recreate the feeling in the other movement sense. So I think those things work well. Yeah. I, I do like that stuff. Yeah. Perfect. Thanks, Steve. And the excellent presentation. Oh, thank you. Thanks for joining in. Thanks everybody for being here tonight. So uh, it's nice to get this many people on talking about biomechanics. Hey, Not Steve, always a really good presentation. Topic. Thanks, Eric. Enjoyed it a lot. Um, I got a question about wickets of bringing it back to sure, yeah. back to that with your just distance runners do you have uh do you mix it up between acceleration and um them running at a constant speed or, or what's uh what's your well I'll, I'll tell you we've because of the nature of the beast that we have when we're training at the seps uh for those familiar with our our track the indoor track is where we spend a lot of time obviously in the winter um because of the, the very few lanes and the very little space we have we've defaulted to one set of wickets that we sort of use as our go-to because we can set it up uh, on the track easily without getting in the way of other people and so on and so on. Um, so the, the set that we use is I have a set of cones that I set up basically an acceleration ladder, a standard sort of acceleration ladder of cones where we, um, which we actually do those on another day. We tend to do those acceleration ladders as a separate thing. Um, mm -hmm. So often on a Monday, we would do the acceleration ladders. And then on a Tuesday, we would, we would add the wickets into it. And we use the same acceleration ladder to lead into the wickets purely because it then sets up, there's no guesswork on where do they have to be to get into the wickets correctly. They know if they follow right. the ladder, they're gonna be right into the wickets because the last wickets, uh, the last ladder spacing matches with the first wicket spacing. So it's the same stride right. length that they're into already. And then as they go through, we use 10 wickets mostly. We usually just use 10, although we've used as many as 20 um, at a go. But the 10 wickets we have set up, um, we stretch them out a little bit as they go along. So the first couple are at a 165 centimeter spacing. Um, and then we kind of go out to 175 and then 185. Um, very, you know, it's a very gradual progression. It's just enough that as they pick up speed, as they go through it, they don't have to change the rhythm of what they're doing. It sort of adjusts to their rhythm a little bit. Um, and it's short enough spacings that everybody can make it through. Although I will admit that uh, one of the athletes I work with, Jordan uh, Henry, who's a, quite a fast sprinter, um, he can't do the wickets at all at those spacings. It's, he's like tripping over himself. His legs are long and he's very fast. And it just, so usually if we're doing wickets with him, I set up a completely separate set of wickets for him that are actually at 2.2 meter spacings. Um, and he whips through those quite nicely. Um, the 185 spacing, he's pretty much tripping over himself to, to stay in them. So um, if you have faster sprinters, you, you kind of need to go to those bigger spacings and stuff. They're just going to struggle with the shorter ones. But for most people, right from high school on up through my university guys, that spacing that we're using seems to sort of male, female, doesn't seem to matter. It sort of hits. Yeah. Ideally, I'd love to have two or three different sets of spacings set up 
but it's just not practical in our training environment to do that. So we just defaulted to like, okay, this is our spacing and everybody, everybody still gets something out of it. It's not ideal, but it's kind of what's practical. Great. Yeah. Do you put tape down for them to uh, use as markers for foot placement? Uh, no. Well, what we do is we just kind of like that acceleration ladder, we set the cones to the side of the, uh, like on the side of the lane. And okay. we just tell them to try to project their hips to be beside the cones it's, rather than their foot beside the cone. We kind of try to get them to think about where their hips are and, and pushing their hips towards those cones as they contact. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, and then I've, uh, what I've done, clever fellow that I am is on the indoor track, I've taken a marker and, and marked all those spacings and markers. So if somebody mm -hmm. kicks a hurdle, we just have to go back and put it by the, by the marker. Uh, you know, the little black line that I've put in there and this, you know, and same for the acceleration ladder, we've got it inked in there so we can quickly set it up at the start of practice, we don't have to get the tape measure out. But having said that, I, you know, I did wickets with the high school group of high school kids on the weekend. And, uh, you know, I just had my, my handy little tape measure and a bunch of pylons and I set it up lickety split in a few minutes. Like it doesn't take a long time to do it even by yourself. And if you got two of you, you can do it really quick, but even by yourself, you can set up pretty quick. So I, I I've actually yeah. found it to be probably one of the things I've been happiest about adding in over the last, you know, five or six years, because I was so kind of resistant to it at first. And then when I dug into it and thought, how could I use this and would it work? And then we experimented it. We went, oh yeah, it works brilliantly. And now I, like I say, we probably do it on a weekly basis with everybody, like yeah. distance runners, sprinters, jumpers, everybody. In fact, my jumps coach really likes to use it a lot with his jumpers just to set up runway rhythms for them. Mm -hmm. uh, he'll have them do some wicket runs to, to help with runway uh, stuff. So yeah, I've become a big fan of the wickets. Yeah, yeah, me too. Great, thanks, Steve. Yeah, you're very welcome. All right, any uh, any other questions or comments? Or uh, I don't want to keep people on all night, but I certainly would like to take any questions you have. Yeah, I, I had actually another one. Yeah, uh, lay it on me, Taylor. So you you talked about how important uh, knee extension is, mm. in, especially in like the first few steps mm. where you know we're getting out of the blocks and there really isn't as much uh, like breaking force because you're not already moving at a high speed. So, right, so it's your opportunity to kind of get some acceleration at a, at a low cost, if you will. Yep. Um, but I noticed on the EMG figure that you showed at the beginning that the yep. quads aren't really turned on around the end of stance. So you, you were talking about how like, you know, it's the quadricep muscles extending. Is it, is it the quadriceps or could it be like, you know, hip or ankle like musculature because like as you're yeah. you, like, because you're projected so far forward right like yeah your center but, mass is already in front yeah by the time you get to the end of stance there's actually not a lot that's happening um in terms of power productions mm -hmm. most of the work is done through that early to mid stance and then that's why it's so important if, if you look at where the ground release is on a lot of like if you look at an elite distance runner or you look at a at a um an elite sprinter once they get to that foot to the back side it doesn't push very much like it doesn't go to full extensions right it's it's actually abbreviated and so there's a limited amount of power production that happens at that last sort of section of the stance phase um so it becomes a trade-off of like okay is there a big focus on like the knee extensor is already finished because at that point the leg is already essentially straight right so there's not a lot that the, the quadriceps are going to be able to do. The gluteus group is already in a flex state. So there's not really much they can do when you're in that already sort of essentially hyperextended position. You're past, you've gone past the neutral and you're into the extension. They're shortening and they become less effective as the shorter they get. And then the hamstrings are really actually very poor <laughs> um, hip extensors because they're designed for speed, not, not power. They're, they're very... Um, thin but long muscles so they're built for speed of contraction but not really um, built for maximum force production because they're in a in a um, a serial um, alignment of of sarcomeres i'm getting wordy now but anyway you know what i mean you know what i mean some other people are going what the hell is he talking about but you know what i'm talking about so um as you get to the back side of the stance phase there becomes less and less work that you're going to be able to do and it's really just about the follow through is really, you're at the, the follow through the ground strike. Uh, if you think of hitting a baseball, you know, or hitting a golf ball, 
most of the work is done before you hit the ball. And then while you're in contact with the ball, but once the ball is sort of leaving the bat or leaving the golf club, there's a follow through where the energy transfer is finished. And to a certain extent, that's what happens in, in running, not quite exactly the same, but once you've had that big ground strike at the initial contact and made that big push through the mid stance, the further along through the contact you get as you get to toe off, there's less and less work that can be done because the muscles are all spent. They're already in the positions where they finish. The knee is extended. The hip is extended. The only thing left is the ankle. But if you focus on a whole bunch of plantar flexion to get an extra push, what you end up doing is also slowing down the stride rate for a very little contribution from the, from that ankle extension, you know, or plantar flexion, I should say. Um, so it becomes a trade-off that's not really a winning proposition to a certain extent. So if you focus too much on trying to generate power all the way through the ground contact, you end up with a follow-through that continues after the ground release. The foot, because of the follow-through now, is going to continue backward as well instead of getting back to the front side. So it becomes a trade-off on that stride rate a little bit. So it's better to think about the ankle being a source of stiffness during that ground contact, particularly through that early and middle stance phase, as opposed to thinking of it as a power production at the toe off, because there really is very little that's going to contribute in terms of that power, but it's also going to cost you in terms of the ground contact time of making it um, longer. Actually, let me see. I have another, oh, see if I can find it here. Um, I have a, um, uh, a slide if I can if I can get through the eight million things I have open on my computer right now. Um, I have a, or a, a, not a slide rather, but a graph that uh, I'd love to share with you guys if I can find it real quick here. I apologize um, if I can find it quickly. I was going to put it into the presentation tonight, but I was worried about the presentation getting a little little too long, um, which it obviously is because I'm talking. Um, da, 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 da. Let me find the right one here. Uh, dang damn it where did i put it oh it's a great it was a great um it was a great tweet that came out from uh, uh jonas uh, dodu if anybody knows him he's uh he used to do some work at, at altus but i think he's actually out on his own now oh here it is i found it um so one of the things that they were talking about um and it comes from work from Peter Wayan, who's a biomechanist down in the States. Some of you might be familiar with his um, stuff. So I'm going to put up on the screen here, hopefully. Um, I can find again from the 8 million things I have on here. Okay. Uh, I'm going to share on the screen a picture um, that uh, Jonas put up. Um, there we go. And what they were talking about, um, and again, this comes from... Um, from Peter Wayans um, work, looking at what makes people run faster and faster. So when they looked at collecting some data on runners, what they found is that most people had more or less the same uh, contact distance. And they identify that as the horizontal distance that the center of mass travels from the time the foot hits the ground till it leaves the ground. And if you look at the, uh, they're looking at about a 60 degree sweep of the leg sort of thing. Um, but for most people, it was give or take a little bit of that, obviously, depending on the length of the person's leg and so on, but, but about a 60 degree sweep. And so what they found was that the biggest factor um, was looking at how quickly can you make that ground contact? Because if you're covering the same distance, if you can do that one meter distance in less and less time, then that's a win. And when you look at, when you look at the, um, the ways that we, where those ground forces are, are coming from, most of it happens in the first two thirds of the stance phase. And so that last little bit, as we push through to extension, um, we, we, you know, we're still creating impulse, both vertical and horizontal impulse, but it becomes a, 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 a trade-off of like, it tails off. And at some point, if we continue to push that through too far, we're becoming longer and longer on the ground. And the research shows that that's going to have the opposite effect of what we want and that we're spending too much time on the ground. We can't get back to the front side and apply the big forces in the first two thirds of the ground contact. So we're delaying when we can apply the big forces by applying the little forces a little too long. So it's kind of a trade off. At some point you kind of go like, I can still be pushing through there, but 
you know, it would be like, you know, I can create huge pushes and huge forces by bounding, but we don't bound very fast. We sprint much faster than we bound, right? And there's a point between bounding and sprinting where it's like, okay, the trade-off has gotten out of hand. Like we're not getting what we wanted out of that. So I, I think that's the big, and, and again, every athlete's going to be different too. Like there's a, a, a parameter in there that's got some wiggle room for different lengths of legs and different types of muscle characteristics. You're going to have some athletes who are super springy and that ground contact is going to be like lightning. And you're going to have other athletes who are a little, you know, can handle a little more ground contact time because they also can generate huge forces during that ground contact. Uh, and so they can still create a lot of impulse uh, even though they're on the ground for a while. Um, so it, it's an interesting one when you look at the numbers and the trade-offs, but certainly when you look at distance running, um, it shows that the elite distance runners are off the ground quicker than the less elite, the sub-elite and the, and the novice, you know, the ground contacts become longer and become more push-based rather than ground strike-based. Well, that's interesting that you say that, Steve, because like in my mind, what I'm thinking when I, when you said that, right, it's not necessarily a question of how long you're in contact with the ground, because, you know, you'd actually want to spend longer on the ground if you could, if you could, yeah, you could apply the same average force, right? Because that means you're going to get more impulse, right? But what that means is, you know, elite runners are applying higher or sorry, they're, they're uh, on the ground for a short period of time. That means they're able to apply higher forces. So basically like elite athlete or like these elite distance runners, they're able to right. apply more force and right. then they can get off the ground and, and keep running at a faster speed. And then as you run at faster speeds, you're going to have shorter contact times. That's just like the nature of the game, right? Exactly. So it becomes, you could stay on the ground longer and you could create impulses, but there would become a point where the trade-off is not worth it. Yeah, you well, you have to be moving so slow in order right. to not leave the ground. Exactly. Right? Yeah, and then so yeah, so it's kind of like it's self-defeating. The goal is it, not to yeah. spend long on the ground, but you know you can you know if you can apply force for yeah. So when, I mean, if you think ground. about it, what you're trying to do is you're trying to tune the spring, right? Mm -hmm. So by having really stiff ankle and knee joints, you're having a really stiff spring which can take energy and return it very quickly. So that rate of force production um, becomes improved by having that stiff knee and ankle joint as opposed to having really big um i don't want to say mushy but really big long but slower contacts yeah we lose that elastic potential and we lose some energy in that too because the elastic tissues don't work well with slower contacts yeah. so we get the elastic component as well as the active components of the muscle contributing to that really quick springy action. So that, I mean, that's why there was tons of good research um, from Europe uh, on the effects of plyometric training with long distance running, like 10,000 meter runners and stuff. When they started to incorporate more bounding and stuff into their training, the, uh, the benefits were massive. And at first, you know, it seemed counterintuitive. People were like, why are they doing this power training? Why is that helping these endurance runners? And then, and they realized it's because of the mechanics of the contact, they're training the person to have these stiffer, ground contacts by dealing with the impacts of plyometrics of bounding and hopping and it creates a stiffer spring which then translates to their running to then have a stiffer spring when they're running yeah so it kind well, of tunes it, the it tunes the spring yeah and it almost goes even further than that like the the image that you showed there about the, like the excursion angle right like from mm -hmm. uh, yep. this, where you know we're talking about the angle that the knee yep. the, the body's passing over the foot um there uh, ken clark who had done yep. a lot of work with um, Peter Wayand at uh, Southern Methodist University. Yeah. Yep. Um, so he he was on what's called a like track football consortium. So it was just like a yeah, talk. I know. Yeah. And he was he was talking about how like you know that in order to basically get through that range faster, like what what a what a ten meter per second sprinter does that an eight meter per second sprinter can't do is cover the like it's like that that the hammer they're prepping the hammer with like the the front thigh the higher that they can lift it right like you're showing the you say that. Yeah. right they're getting a like a, a they're moving that thigh downward like that downstroke's happening at a faster angular velocity so yeah. that by the time they hit the ground right they're applying higher forces and it and it's yeah like, that's said, exactly like a more it. it's a, a tighter but taller ground reaction force profile yeah exactly um, um, I laugh because when you say hammer, because that's been my big mantra with uh, with my athletes for the last year or two, okay. is I say, you can't, you don't push a nail into a board, right? Mm -hmm. You can't 
push the nail into the board with the hammer. You strike it, you hammer it, you hammer the nail into the board. You deliver a lot of force in a very rapid explosive movement, boom, to put that nail into the board. You can't, you can't tap, tap, tap it. So you don't want to take little pitter pats, but you also can't take big, long, pushy movements. You want to strike the ground. And, and that becomes the important thing, and especially in acceleration, that ground contact becomes all about striking the ground rather than putting your foot on the ground and pushing. You yeah. strike the ground to create large impact force and immediately, hopefully if the foot is positioned well, that it's under the hip and you're pushing back, you're striking and creating a huge vertical and massive horizontal ground reaction force at that ground strike, right? It's all about striking yeah. exactly like a hammer into a nail. Yeah, and it's funny, like, it's funny you didn't mention this when you're talking about Usain Bolt, but like, that's one of the things that he does really well as a guy, oh, yeah. with, a tall guy with long legs. Um, yeah. But but was it really interesting? That, so they, there is a, I can't remember where I saw this, but they had like force velocity profiles. Mm -hmm. I think it was at actually an Altus like talk. Yeah. Um, so basically, they had force velocity profiles of you know athletes in general, right? Is just like this like uh, inverse relationship, like yeah. linear curve. And then you have like elite sprinters are out here. So they're further up. Yeah. They can produce higher forces at higher speeds. Yeah. And then Usain Bolt's curve in re relation to those sprinters are, is like this. So basically yeah. he can apply higher forces at higher speeds, not yeah. necessarily higher forces period, yeah. but basically when he gets up to top speed, he's yeah. basically, you know, again, loading that hammer up to yeah. be able to produce higher, like a, a higher force as he's like, moving at higher and higher and higher speeds. Right. And he, he keeps accelerating to like 64 meters or something ridiculous. in the yeah. hundred. And, and actually the, the other neat one is if, if you find it, I think it's on YouTube somewhere. There's, there's a, it was done by a Japanese TV. Um, some sports scientists in Japan did uh, an analysis of Asafa Powell back when he was the record holder and they did um, um, imaging. They did scans like head to toe doing slices to get uh, cross-sectional areas and when they got to his iliopsoas uh it was uh, oh thanks Yvonne uh, sorry everybody I just seen all these messages of people that are leaving and thanking so thank you guys for joining in glad you could be here um yeah when they looked at Asafa Powell's uh iliopsoas uh you know for most people it's kind of like the size of your your hand sort of thing like a cupped in hand and his is like a, a ham <laughs> <laughs> it's just this massive, massive. So he's got these really long legs, but because of the massive size and strength of his iliopsoas, uh, he can get that massive long lever accelerated back to the front side quicker than you would think. And, and historically speaking, we would have thought of long legged sprinters as being um, long stride length, but not able to hit as high a stride rate as a shorter sprinter. And the big groundbreaking shock came when Asafa Powell started, you know, this big tall guy. And then obviously Bolt being the next kind of version of that these guys with these massive long legs who also could create really high um, stride rates because they had such strong hip flexors to get all those things back to the front side. And that sets up the ground. I mean, the whole point of high knee running has nothing to do with the knee. It has to do with creating the space to accelerate the foot now back to the track and really maximize that speed. So that relative foot speed that I mentioned in the slides, that only comes about if you have the room to accelerate it. If you've spent too much time on the backside and you don't have time to get the knee back to a high front side position, you're going to end up with a low knee swing, which also means you have less room, uh, less distance to accelerate the foot to the track. And so as a result, the foot is slower when it hits the track because you haven't given it the room to actually get up to speed. And so the, the whole point of high knees is that it creates the space to accelerate the foot, to have that relative foot speed that you're looking for, to have that really active ground strike. And so, it, one thing feeds into another, right? Like that's what becomes the really good mechanic is getting off the ground at the backside. Yes, it would be good to continue to push all through, but not if it sacrifices us being able to get that knee back to the front side to create the good ground strike to give us the big push on those the first part of the stance phase. So that we're hitting the ground active, having that big forces in the initial contact. And we sacrifice that little bit on the back end to maximize on that stuff on the front end. And every sprinter obviously is different in what's sort of the, the optimal for each person. And, you know, Mike, Michael Johnson was a great example of somebody who did something a little different than everybody else. And it worked beautifully for him. 
but trying to mimic what he did was not a very good thing for most people because most people weren't Michael Johnson. <laughs> you know, his physiology and his anatomy were very unique to him. And it led to him being able to do some things that other people just physically can't do. So it's always a question of what's optimal, but what's optimal for the person and not just, you know, there's an optimal general model, but then we also have to have that meet with what is best, what's the optimal model for the specific athlete too, because obviously those come in a wide range of limb lengths, you know, segment lengths, thigh length versus shank length is different in everybody. Uh, even yeah. left and right sides is different in everybody and, you know, all those things, as well as the muscle physiology and the nervous system physiology is different from person to person. So everybody's got a little different model of what's best, but there's certainly parameters that we all operate under that we know are kind of the effective things. Awesome. You guys must be bored out of your minds by now. Me? No. No, you're, no, you're as like a, me. As a master, <laughs> yeah, a couple, mechanics, couple of you guys but... will stay on here all night, I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, sorry, I, I had one last thing, but yeah, I, mean, I definitely don't want to. Okay. Um, so and a really interesting thing that you're talking about, like the step with like aligning mm. that, like the, the feet with the hips in the blocks. Um, I thought this was really interesting. This is like a debate I was getting into with my, with my coach the other day, because, uh, in like last year I had to do like a 10 page paper on like review of sprint gate. And right. one of the studies I looked at was like, uh, there's these Japanese studies that Stuart McMillan posted a massive thread on it, but mm -hmm. it's like basically step width is not actually inversely related with, with uh, block exit velocity. Mm -hmm. So um, not necessarily clearance time, but like, yeah. you know, basically the idea that you want to be leaving the, the blocks with a high speed, that means that you yeah. apply the large forces, right? So that's yeah. like a, a good KPI for, you know, your block time. Um, but you know, they, they found that like having wider steps, although, you know, from an eye test, you're like, this doesn't look right. It doesn't look very efficient. Right. Yeah. Um, somehow it was actually, uh, positively correlated with, uh, like exit velocity from the blocks or from the, the start distance in these different studies. And, um, you know, just like thinking about it more and more when you were talking about like the, the ground contact time at the beginning, you know, um, I, it made me wonder like, why that might be the case like if you look at a sport like hockey right for example you yeah. have this you, you you can't you don't have an edge in like the front back direction so you yep. can't push you know you, yep. you, you see guys kind of start in like a v stance but like you can't actually like skate pushing yeah. straight back so they push out straight out to the side and so like that's why you have this like you know opposite yeah. uh, like arm swing right in yeah. in this uh the transverse plane or sorry uh the frontal plane yeah um but Anyway, they're like the ground contact time or like ground contact time for hockey skating is like, yeah. you know, three to six times longer yeah. what it is in, in, uh, in sprinting. So it kind of made me wonder, like, even though they move at higher speeds than, than, you know, we do on the track, could it be because they're in contact in that like lateral fashion? So as they move forward, they can stay in contact with the ground. Whereas, you know, you're literally moving away from your, your fixation point. Like, yeah. is that, is that, could that be part of why, like you're actually increasing ground contact. So you're able to get like higher levels of impulse at the beginning of a sprint from that. Yeah. Potentially. I, I think one of the things probably though, that, that most people would use a little wider because there is a certain amount of external rotation um, that will take place in those first pushes. And it's much easier to, to have that external rotation be oriented in the way that will accelerate you forward. If the feet are a little wider, if you, if you were to have your foot hit right under your center mass and then have external rotation take place, it would result in you having some translation side to side or some potential rotations around that wouldn't be, be helpful. Um, I think to a certain extent that when we're making those, first few contacts there is a tendency to have a little more external rotation happen certainly in some people i mean i had a one sprinter that i coached years ago who had absolutely zero external rotation in his foot contacts and right from his first step out of the blocks his feet were hitting almost in a straight line on out um he was very unique in that way and, and he generated he was a super fast starter and, and generated a lot uh he was very light he had a good uh you know strength to mass ratio and stuff but used no external rotation in his hip at all in those first steps it was all very linear underneath him but most people i think tend to use a little bit of, of you know gluteus medius external rotators to create a little extra push 
And if it's done well, it doesn't it doesn't result in lateral translation, right? It doesn't result in side to side movement of the hips. That little wider stance and external rotation actually gets pointed down the track. Um, so I think that's one reason that the wider stance works in those first few steps is because you can use a little external rotation. We're on the ground long enough that that external rotation can take place and contribute in a meaningful way. Um, that once you get moving faster and faster, that's obviously not something that's effective and, and yeah, would result sure. in, in a lot of problems. For sure. Yeah. I mean, just like the eye test, right? You're like, you're watching, it's like moving side to side as you're at max speed, not very efficient. Yeah. So but, yeah, certainly at the start. Anyway, thanks. Yeah. So I, the, 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 um, the follow Milan Co. I don't Are you familiar with Milan Co.'s work? He's yeah. So he did a couple of studies and I can't remember if they were in new studies in athletics or if they were in general biomechanics or uh, international uh, journal of uh, sports biomechanics. I can't remember where he had published a few of them, probably in all of those. Um, but he did a couple studies where he looked exactly at that, looking at uh, where the foot placements were in the first, you know, 10 meters and found invariably that the first step out of the blocks, the feet were actually wider than what the pedals were and then narrowed back down as the person accelerated. And so these new wider blocks make perfect sense to me in that you can essentially then set up in a way that potentially is more similar to what you're going to do in those first couple of steps rather than kind of awkwardly pushing for some people. It might allow those people with wider hips and stuff to be able to push more effectively off the pedal than, than they do with more traditional narrow blocks. Yeah, or even get that like external rotation through, yeah. through block exit, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's so, really interesting. That's really I, I I'm, can't wait till the day when we can afford to have some of those big pedals because I would really like to try them and have the athletes on them and, and see how what we can do with them. But I'm afraid our budget doesn't allow for that for a while. <laughs> With, with the, like the point on the blocks, like, uh, not again, like you have that, uh, you don't have the, the heel drop over the yeah. top of the block. Is that like, I, I know that a lot of people talk about that being like a, almost like a trigger, right? You're like, you're where you're, you really, you're loading the Achilles tendon and trying to get this like yeah. shortening reflex out of it. Do you think that there's like a drawback from having these massive pedals that don't allow you to get that heel drop? Um, Potentially, yes, but it also gives you, I, th I think probably what it does, I think I said, I think it potentially creates a more um, repeatable start mechanic for most people. It might be a disadvantage for those people who use that very effectively, unfortunately. Right. Um, but I think for a wide range of people, it's probably going to result in them being able to more reliably have good starts. The people who are already great starters, it might not affect them at all, or it may, as you suggest, it may actually impact them negatively in that that stretch reflex they get is not going to be available to them. Maybe they'll end up having a rule where you'll have the choice of what kind of pedal you put on, right? You know, oh, I want the wide pedal on, on mine, or I want the narrow pedal, or I want, you know, whatever. I don't know. could get complicated, but at the world exactly. level, I could imagine it. I mean, a, a quick little story about that. Uh, I don't know. You guys probably might be familiar with Brent McFarlane or his writings. Anyway, Brent passed away a number of years ago. I was fortunate enough to take my level three with Brent, and he was a super interesting guy. One of the things that he did back in the day is um, he used something called a Moy block. Are you, any of you guys familiar with the Moy block? It's a really different kind of starting block. If you want to look it up, it's M-O-Y-E. It was the name of the guy that I think that, you know, invented them, uh, engineered them, whatever. M-O-Y-E, Moy block. I think they're still in use some places. You know, there's, there's still some people that like them and use them. Um, the, uh, the, uh, um, the thing with the Moy block is it, it used a, a, a really huge back pedal, a really tall, steep back pedal, and a very low, sort of almost flat front pedal. Essentially, it wasn't a front pedal. The front pedal was the front of the rail. And it was designed for you to have your spikes on the track and your heel on this little kind of pedal-like thing. And then the back pedal was this big, tall, massive uh, thing. We actually have a set at the SEPs. And, and when I was uh, in Alberta, I did a research study comparing Moy blocks to standard blocks. It was one of my little you know, side research project things. Anyway, um, the neat thing that Brent did with them is he liked them because he thought they allowed hurdlers to get to a taller stance sooner to get to the first hurdle upright, you know, for, for, for a sprint hurdler. He, he liked these blocks because he thought they could get good acceleration, but be in a more upright stance to get to the first hurdle. So he showed up at a meet with a set of these blocks for his athlete to use. And the officials uh, said, no, you can't, you can't, you can't use your own blocks. Everybody has to have the same sort of opportunity. You can't 
you know, have you use one kind of block and everybody else is using these other ones. So he went out and bought seven more sets and showed up at the next meet with seven sets of them and said there or eight sets of them and said there, everybody, everybody has the option. And the officials were like, um, uh, <laughs> you know, what can you do anyway? Oh, there is. I, and in fact, I, I, when I was doing the research project, I found out that the NCAA division, uh, Oh, see you, Nick. Um, the NCAA division three championships one year, had the option of either using standard blocks or Moy blocks. Um, and that's the only time I've been able to see anything. It was in the technical package for the division NCAA division three championships, that that was an option. I think it was probably because the host school happened to own eight sets of Moy blocks or something, but you don't really see them. Uh, you know, they're not something that you see a lot of, but they are still around and they're still, and they're, in fact, I know some coaches from Saskatchewan used to basically do what they called a modified Moy start. They would use standard blocks but set them up in a way that the sprinter could essentially do a Moy style start from a standard set of blocks. Um, so they, they used the front pedal. They would put the front pedal as low as it would go and they would put the spike plate on the track and only put the heel against the pedal. So there is no heel drop. The heel is right on the pedal for the front foot, but the back foot, they would have the foot way up on the pedal and have a lot of you know, potentially heel drop over the top of it because it's a normal pedal, but they'd have the block very steep. And so you end up with this set position that's very close to the start line with a very high hip position. And you almost essentially fall into your start um, to get to that sort of acceleration position. Anyway, they're kind of neat. I, I would love to uh, follow up on the study I did in Alberta because I, I didn't collect enough data on men and women together to sort of do the whole big study I want to do. So someday I plan to go back and do it like just for fun. But you know, it's, it's interesting when you look at the options that we have, because really when you look at starting blocks, they haven't changed a hell of a lot other than now with the, the big pedals. There hasn't been a, much innovation in starting blocks for, you know, 70 years. So it's interesting now that finally we're starting to see some things that may potentially change the game for starting the way that, you know, the shoes and all that kind of stuff are changing it in other ways. So yeah, it might be interesting to watch with these big pedals. I was excited to watch the meet there from uh, uh, the other day that was on the, uh, from Portland, from Oregon. Uh, and they had the, they, they look so ridiculously huge when you see them because we're used to seeing little pedals. They looked ridiculous, <laughs> but obviously produced some pretty good starts and stuff. But I do think it's something that people would have to have access to in their training to practice on them, to be comfortable with it for it to be really effective. Yeah. Even, even like a research study without like. Oh, Kathleen people, is leaving. Kind of... See you, Kathleen. Thank you. Excuse me. Thank you for joining. Yeah, like, Sorry. Yeah. No, no problem. Like even in like a research study, like you don't give people enough time to like practice on it. Like it might yeah. not give you accurate readings on, on yeah, what exactly. But, but what, what, like, what were the findings of your study? Just out of curiosity. Like, I know yeah, it was, it was a uh, boy that was, you know, 15 years ago. So I, I got to think about, but um, I think the big thing that we found was it did create um, a different acceleration pattern. Um, oh, good night, Sharon. Thanks for joining. Um, yeah, it, it, it was the, the problem that we had with the study was that basically all of our subjects were track athletes who were quite familiar with normal starting blocks and weren't familiar with moist starting blocks. And so I think that any advantage of them probably was masked by the fact that people didn't have enough chance to really get comfortable and, and use them or whatever. Our plan had been to also have a bunch of field sport athletes who didn't know starting blocks at all and have them use both kinds of blocks and see if there was a difference with people who weren't trained on, on either one. Um, and then obviously a great thing would be to have people who were trained on Moy blocks to also, you know, but, uh, I think it's something where it, I don't know that it's great, but it seems like at least it was an innovation. It was something to push the boundaries of like what works and, and what's a different way to tackle this. Cause honestly, uh, like Gerard Mock wrote in a book uh, years ago, uh, God rest his soul, um, that you know nothing had changed in terms of starting even when you go back before starting blocks if you look at when we were digging holes in the track the position of those holes was the same as what we did when we started putting blocks in place um so there really isn't a lot of innovation in terms of sprints if you look at what jesse owens did coming out of the starts it's really not that radically different i mean it looks funny because of the speed of the film a little bit is jerky and stuff usually but the mechanics of the start and of sprinting haven't really changed in a hundred years um so it's going to be interesting to see now that we are starting to push the boundaries a little bit with the block design and stuff to see if suddenly we will come up with some new innovations about how to start. You know, Ben, for those of you old enough to remember Ben Johnson, 
he was a little bit of an innovator, but again, it was innovation that was really based on his physiology. The way he started was phenomenal, but it wasn't something that anybody else could easily reproduce. You had to have the nervous system and the, the power production of a Ben Johnson to start like Ben Johnson. It wasn't like every high school kid could suddenly go out and have these massive strong back extensors and, and hip extensors that would put you into this massive leaping extension out of the blocks. Like it just wasn't going to happen. So it, that's the tough part with innovation. Sometimes we see what happens with the best in the world and we think that that's a model to work towards, but then we realize they're the best in the world because they're freaks and everybody else is not a freak. Everybody else is not going to be able to hit those positions or generate those forces or do those things in that way. So when it comes to those shoes, you know, the new super shoes and it comes to those new blocks and stuff, that is something that everybody potentially has access to eventually and becomes then something that maybe creates a more level playing field. And that, like I said, those bigger blocks might make the poor starters become good starters. And the great starters are just going to stay great starters maybe. Or maybe it does dial them back to good. And then whew, then we really see a change in what's going on in the sprints, right? But um, anything that levels the playing field potentially makes it more interesting. But you know, then also you end up with another freak of nature who matches with what that new thing is and suddenly is phenomenal at it. You know, So that's always the case. But I think it's fun to watch all those kinds of innovations. But I, I, I do worry, to get back to the shoes, I do worry about how much we do with the shoes. <laughs> Because I do think we will end up like cycling where it's like, okay, this has gotten out of hand. It's now who has the most money to have the best bike, not who has the best training and the best physiology to be the best rider. So the, the riders almost become incidental. Yeah. Like a horse jockey. <laughs> exactly. Horse, yeah. Right. If you've got the best horse, you're going to win. <laughs> yeah. Right on, Steve. Well, thanks for all your time. I'm all right, go. guys. This was fun. Yeah. yeah, thanks a ton. Yeah, thank you. Awesome. All right. Well, have a good night. And uh, yeah, we'll uh, probably in a month or so, I think that we'll be doing the next one, which I think is going to be jumping. And then we'll have one later in the summer on throwing. So that's awesome. All right. Look forward to it. All right, gang. Stay safe and uh, train well. Sounds good. Ciao. Yeah, you too. I see Julia stuck onto the bitter end. Hi, Julia.